it looks like we have everyone ready. Everyone's here, so we can get started with uh, the final portion of our symposium today. My name is Zach Powers. I am the artistic director at the Writer Center. Oh. Thank, thank you. She just likes the word artistic, not me. Um, she cheers anytime we say it. Um, but yes, and sometimes I get to host, host events and do things like this, and I'm really kind of excited for this one. This was an interesting topic to me, uh, and something that, not something I write about uh, explicitly, but something that has come up in a couple of writing projects I've done, long-form writing projects, so there has been some research, so I was really excited that I, I get to ask the questions today. So hopefully, hopefully they're good questions, and hopefully, too, we'll get some questions from the audience. So if you have, qu we'll, we'll start off with some questions from me, and then pretty early on, we'll see if people have questions. I'd much rather take your questions than mine. Um, for those, I also want to say thank you so much to those of you who battled Metro today. Uh, I heard we were single lining on one of the Metro lines, so those of you who, who still got here despite Metro trying its darndest to prevent us from, from gathering today, that's, that's really appreciated. Yeah, shame on Metro pretty much whenever. Um, but <laughs> as long as, I mean, I said that, probably something was on fire. As, I, as long as nothing was on fire, it was probably a fire. It's the red line. It's the red line. <laughs> That's why they call it the red line. It's always burning. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just welcome to the Writers Center. Uh, I know we have some new people. Uh, Amy, who's in the back and was previously modeling cardigans, um, is happy to show anyone around if you don't know the building already uh, after we're done today during the reception period after this panel discussion. Uh, yeah, she, she will be happy to show you the lost and found and other aspects of the Writer Center. So please, please reach out to her if you haven't been here and want to see a little bit more of what we have to offer. It's, it's a really fantastic building with about 12,000 square feet. So you've, we've only seen upstairs. There's a whole downstairs as well to the place. You've seen most of upstairs at this point. So except those of you who are in this room, you, you, missed, uh, you missed the theater and the other workshop room. Yeah. All right. So... Uh, just real quickly, I just want to first, most of all, thank our panelists, uh, our workshop leaders, and our and our ex and our uh, guest panelists as well. We have Iman Iman Quota, we have Eve Ettinger, we have Jen Quater and Sophia Abdurrahman, and um, I'm so so pleased that they're here. And to get started, I'm going to ask them to maybe introduce themselves, starting nearest to me, and then also share how faith has appeared in or influenced their writing. So uh, just a little introduction of who they are and why they're the people who are on this panel today. So Jen, if you'd like to kick us off. Hi, I'm Jen Coiter. Um, I was raised fundamentalist and Pentecostal, which will give you a lot to write about uh, later in life. I, um, I do, just for the sake of transparency, I do still identify as a Christian, albeit a, a weird lefty one. Um, I and and the way that that faith shows up in my work, um, it, I feel like it's just it shows up the way everything else does. It's something I want to figure out, and uh, and writing is the, is the the best way I know how. Um, and I will never run out of spiritual things to try and figure out. So um, I'll pass it along. I'm Iman Quota. Um, my debut novel, um, Bride of the Sea, came out two years ago this month. Um, I was raised, um, uh, much of my childhood was spent in Saudi Arabia in the 1980s and early 90s. Um, so I had a very religious education. Um, my father is fairly religious. Um, also, um, my mom converted from Christianity, um, but um, didn't become a very religious person. She's more spiritual, and so I grew up identifying as Muslim, being raised as a Muslim, and celebrating Christmas and Easter. Um, and so we didn't call it an interfaith family, but I think that's probably what you should call it. Um, um, and um, I am now married to a Presbyterian, and so we have an interfaith family, um, but my kids are not getting much of a, a religious education. So, um, so religion has always been a part of my life, and, and, but not in, you know, in, in both traditional and non-traditional ways. Um, and um, it shows up in my novel and in some of the um, stories and essays that I've written. Um, as the people who are in my workshop today know, I'm really fascinated with stories of faith and um, using sort of some of the structures and techniques of those 
stories we grew up with, not just scriptural stories, but personal stories of faith as well. Um, we had one in our workshop today that just made everybody go, wow. Um, and um, so, yeah, so faith shows up in my work as something that is part of people's lives. Um, when I teach people about building characters, I tell them, give your characters faith. Like, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious faith. It could be faith in something, but I think that faith as a thing that we humans, like, do have um, is not something that is talked about enough in sort of traditional writing programs. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Eve Ettinger. Uh, they, them pronouns. I write about... Um, leaving fundamentalist Christianity. Um, my background, if you know what this means, was quiverful. Um, I was homeschooled and it was a pretty isolating experience. And so my work tends to deal with um, deconstruction and spirituality and how do you know what you know and how do you heal from losing a lot of things that um, you thought you knew and you know how do you rebuild after that kind of loss so I, I still am, I consider myself culturally Christian, deeply spiritual. Um, I have incorporated some pagan practices into my life as a way of, you know, keeping some kind of liturgy after losing the church. Um, so really excited to be here and be part of this. Hello, I'm Sufia Abdurrahman. I wrote a memoir about my faith experience. Um, it's called Heir to the Crescent Moon. I am the child of two black Muslim converts to Islam um, who converted in the 1970s in Harlem, New York. And um, I grew up as part of the second generation of that, that movement, but also a little bit disconnected from it because at the time my parents were still holding on to Islam but had left their mosque. And so they were struggling with how to raise myself and my siblings um, as believing Muslims but not exactly practicing Muslims. So there was a lot of in between in that. So I feel like in my writing, as in my life, I've always tried to ask and answer questions about faith and demystify faith for people and for myself first and then for other people and readers. Um, and because I'm a personal essayist and I'm a memoirist, it just shows up in everything I do because it's part of my life. I just can't escape it. So sorry if you get tired of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk. This is an exciting topic. And I should say, we meant, I, I, I've read books by three of our guests, Jan, Iman, and, and Sophia. Eve, I've read some of your work before this, too. I don't have a book Did out I, yet. I, I didn't tell you. <laughs> so I will when it arrives, uh, which it seems like it definitely will. But uh, Sophia, I think you might have copies here. So if you're interested in that, please talk to her. I don't, I don't know if either of you brought copies with you. You have a few? Two copies from Jen. So <laughs> mad rush to Jen to get a copy after the, after the panel. But we'll be, if you, during the reception after this, if you want to speak to any of them about their works or where to get them, I highly recommend all the three of those books and then looking up Eve's work as well to, to uh, some of it's available online to find so please look that up so what compels us to write about faith uh, we covered it a little bit maybe but is it something like wonder is it dissatisfaction in some cases is it confusion what is the compulsion that makes this appear in our works uh, maybe go back to you Sophia since yeah yeah, I, I absolutely think that what I've said is, is the reason why I do it is because I've always had questions about it myself. And those questions, I, I should say that I also was trained as a journalist, and that's probably why I got into journalism, because I was always asking questions, and people would sometimes give me answers, and sometimes they would say, stop asking so many questions. <laughs> and sometimes the answers were not satisfying, so I would just ask more questions. Um, and so as that, those questions started to build up and I started to research and interview and find answers, I felt the need to write those things down and share them with the public as journalists do. We get the information and we disseminate it to everyone else. Um, because I really feel like being able to share your experience just helps to, people understand humanity a lot better, to understand this human experience that we're all in. And if we don't keep it to ourselves, then it becomes that much more um, 
approachable as a, as a subject. And faith is one of these subjects, at least from my perspective, that people are, they want to keep it at arm's length. It's like, oh, I can't talk about that. You know, you're not supposed to talk about that because it's a touchy subject. But I don't think it has to be. Um, I think that the more that you can actually have conversations about it, the easier it is to understand someone else's perspective and realize that you have a lot more common with someone else than you thought you did, even if their faith experience is completely different from yours. As long as you're, well, and even if you're not a believing person, um, sometimes that can also be a connecting factor because they may not believe in a higher power necessarily, but have faith in something else. And then that still allows you to connect with people on that level. So yeah, the demystification and connection is, is one short answer. Yeah. Anyone else? I won't call names. I, I just, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, curiosity, but not idle curiosity. Like, a, a desperate need to understand. And I, I would say that's also kind of why I write about grief. I think that's a close analogy for me. Oh, that's great. I think because, like, growing up in uh, Saudi Arabia, just faith, religion, more so than faith maybe was just part of every day you know it wasn't it wasn't something that you, you could hold at arm's length if you wanted to really um, or you could but you'd have to kind of hide that you were holding it at arm's length um, so so that just that fact of growing up that way I think makes it something that I want to write about and talk about and um, I think also having um, you know people in my background and who I know who converted, um, you know, it's not just my mom and many of the, um, I grew up with a bunch of other half Saudi, half American kids whose mothers had converted. So it was like just there, that that movement among faiths. Um, so that's a story, you know. <laughs> um, but also my, my mother-in-law converted from Buddhism to uh, Christianity in Taiwan, um, and so so those like stories of faith seem to be all around me, um, and and I also just really love the contradictions of faith. You know, like I I, I grew up in you know in uh, my in Saudi school, you like religion is part of your education, so we're learning all these sort of conservative traditional things, and then you know we're hearing stories about Lady Fatma riding a camel out to battle, and there's like to me there was this sort of contradiction, but also our religion holds more than you're telling me, you know, so um, there's all these. Um, you know, stories out there, but also the mystery of faith. Um, you know, I, I think as a novelist, faith is, has, is such a rich, maybe not topic, because I don't think that it's just the only thing that I write about, but theme, like thing to weave through your writing. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's it for me. I think one of the things that it comes back to is faith is always about desire. And I think that's, it's a really human experience. Sorry, faith is always about desire and it's a really human emotion and human experience, whether or not it's part of a religion. I kinda got to where I am in a very roundabout way. First, it was a Didion-esque, we tell ourselves stories to live, like, how, how do I know what I know? <laughs> and how do I, how did I get here? Um, kind of trying to shore up my own memory in the midst of trauma and trying to like tell myself again what, what had happened and how I got here. And then, and then interacting with people in the outside world who would be giving me lines like, how did someone who was so smart end up in a cult? Be like, I'm sorry, everyone, everyone can end up in a cult. As, and, and realizing that, you know, what that experience was like is something that everybody could relate to, but they just didn't understand and hadn't been shown how it worked. And so wanting to 
document that for other people, for outsiders, to have compassion for you know, people like me who are leaving this mo movement. Um, and then just kind of coming back to faith is about desire and what we want for ourselves and what we want for each other and what we want from each other and how we sit within not knowing things, our comfort or discomfort with that. Um, it just kind of comes back to a very like visceral experience of yearning for me. <laughs> One thing that came up from several of you there was I think the distinction between religion and faith that those are separate things. And so I'm curious about uh, the difference between, what is the difference between, say, internal faith and an external practice of faith, which are very different for me? And then also, how is that different in, how do you approach writing about those differently? Or is it the same, an internal versus an, uh, an external practice of faith? The feeling versus the ceremony, I guess. I feel like I could write about other people's religion and the expression of other people's religion with greater ease than I could write about someone else's faith. Faith to me seems like something that I could explore for myself, my own experience of faith. Um, I don't know, this is probably, you, like as a novelist, this is probably like absolutely <laughs> anathema to you, but as a poet, I, I feel like I, I um, I would trust my own experience of faith more than anything, um, more mm -hmm. than like my own perceptions of other people's faiths. Mm -hmm. So in, in Arabic, faith is, and, and religion aren't, aren't sent, like, you know, the way we say faith to mean religion in English sometimes, but also it means something different. Um, you can't do that. There's Dean and there's Iman, and my name is Iman, and it means faith. And um, so, to me, they're. I see how they're separated in a lot of the ways that we talk, but for me, they're conflated. Um, but I, I think, and I think also because in the way that Islam is practiced by many people, and, um, and especially in Saudi Arabia, like practice and faith are, are so connected, you know, like, so, um, but in my own life, you know, my practice is my own. Um, and so I practice in some ways and not in others. And some people would say, well, then you're not really Muslim, but, you know, um, I have thoughts about those people, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but for, so for me, for example, I don't drink and, not drinking is a reminder of of my faith, um, and it, it, it's it's something that I do every day. I, uh, every day I don't drink, and every day I have my faith. Um, so, but when I guess when if I'm writing about characters, I'd have to think about that more to really answer it. You know, um, I in my in my novel I wrote about characters with different levels of faith and different levels of practice and different kinds of faith. And so I think that there are ways to kind of mix it up because different people approach it differently and not all your characters are going to believe the same way that you do. Um, so that's a novelist's approach, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think it relates to another one of my questions, which, I mean, for me, I could write critically about religion or external faith practices. And as you were saying, I'd be much, I'd be very hesitant to be critical of someone's internal faith practice, like what they feel in terms of something spiritual. Um, but how do you balance then writing both critically and compassionately about this subject? Because I think it is something that we can be critical of and should be critical of. I hope everyone agrees with that. Um, uh, certainly, I, I, I believe that there's real criticism that should be thrown when made when, when there are bad things done in the name of religion or faith. But so how do you do that without, where's the line? How do you balance the two? Oh, Sophia, you're smiling. I, I, okay. I want to jump in there because I really feel like it's, it's probably up to your readers to decide if you've crossed the line or not. 
I think that as the writer, you try to approach it from a perspective of understanding and, and, and hoping to get your readers to understand where you're coming from. Um, and if you're, well for me, because I'm, I'm a nonfiction writer, I'm always trying to tell the truth, whatever truth that is. And if you find that truth hurtful or harmful, I'm sorry but that's the truth that I'm trying to tell. So if you think that that's me being critical of your perspective or you know, a, a particular part of the religion, then that's how you see it. But for me, it's, it's important to get those pieces out there in order to tell as complete a story as I can possibly tell. Um, so yes, yeah, so it, for when I'm going into a piece, I probably have in mind that people are probably not gonna like this part. <laughs> but I'm going to tell it anyway, and then see what happens. Chips swallow where they may. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the, the challenging part is is trying to not, you know, trying to not worry about that too much. I mean, at a certain point, you know, you you give your characters the rope and they hang themselves. <laughs> Just like uh, there's there's this element of like. I got here because I believed all the things that my community said they believed in and their actions didn't hold out for that. And so writing about that tension and writing, having compassion for my earlier self who did not act in ways that were in accordance with what I believed, what I held in my faith. Um, allows me to both be kind to the others in that community and also critical of them because, hello, I got out. <clears throat> and what are you doing? Um, but there's also this, this, this element of, like you're saying, you tell, the, you tell the truth, you describe what was done, and your reader gets to make of that what they will. Um, I don't think that I have to, I don't think it's my responsibility to particularly, you know, editorialize because a lot of the actions tell on themselves. Um, and that goes both ways. You can have the kind, the kind of people who believe bad things or harmful things within that too. And, and you can see the, the actions following that and, you know, that complexity exists as well. I like that you mentioned I, there's you can be critical but still have empathy towards the individuals within in the subject, which I think is I think that sort of gives you license you've considered the people and that sort of gives you the license to then leverage criticism if you need to. So I think that's an interesting aspect of that. In sort of the other direction from writing critically, there is uh, writing poetically and being I mean uh, I'm a creative writer, so how does faith as a subject inspire poetry, so to speak. I know much, I think we have three prose writers, primarily and one poet, but writing poetically in prose, um, how, does, how does just the experience of faith or the history of faith or religion inspire sort of poetic thought and create, how do we create art from these things we're considering? <laughs> we had a smile last time, we have a deep sigh on this end after. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, for me it's because, um, you know, there's so much storytelling that is associated with um, religious traditions and faith traditions, and so I find that very inspiring. Some of the earliest stories that I was told were stories from my faith, um, and then there's also s stories from our personal lives um, of that are related to faith. We had some some really powerful ones in my workshop today um, of being, you know, spoken to by the spirit and things like that. Um, so I think that if if you if you if you mention the words faith and religion, I think people might automatically go to thinking about the practice of it or the belief of it. But you know, we have um, in especially in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition books. You know, you have your book, um, and there are books, and there is God's book in the sky, and like, you know, so um, so to me, storytelling and faith are so connected that that's where I get the poetry of it, I guess, the and the art of it. Um, that there are there are 
ways that um, these stories and the themes in them and the language of them um, inspires my writing. Not, you know, not every piece of writing goes there exactly, but, um, but a lot of times um, there's a story I want to tell and it is about belief or about uh, good and evil and going back to some of those um, faith stories really helps me to figure out how to tell it. I'll jump in with on this one. I, cause I thought I wanted to connect it back to another question that you asked earlier, Zach, which was about the difference between faith and religion. And I think that um, for me, when I'm approaching writing about faith, I'm trying to get to the get my readers to the point where they can kind of see it as tangibly as they see religion, because I feel like faith is the intangible and the religion is the tangible, and so it takes that poeticism in my writing for them to be able to make that tangible connection to faith, and I, I mean, that's the part that I like the most, I think, um, because it just requires me to really put a lot of thought into each word that I'm choosing and trying to make it come alive on the page so that they can understand what I'm feeling, because it's more of a feeling than an actual like thing. So yeah, the poetry comes out mm -hmm. that way. Okay, I don't think this actually answers your question, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, I feel like the experience of writing poetry and the experience of faith are the moments that I have feel the closest to pulling my whole self together and expressing my entire self. And so um, bringing them together is, is, is just really powerful mm -hmm. for me personally, just experientially. So. I think that answered the question. Okay, yeah. all right, good. <laughs> and I think along, along those lines, like, Poetry is pulling someone into that that moment, an emotion, a moment, a realization, something powerful and internal. And you usually use metaphor to get there. And liturgy, whatever it is within whatever broad definition of that term, is a tangible metaphor. You're using physical objects and motions and community to act out something intangible. Yeah, great. We're about at the halfway point now, so I did want to make sure that we have plenty of time for audience questions uh, and hand up immediately, so. <laughs> Just, I'm going to repeat it for the video, too, so that we have good audio. I think it's sort of how do you approach this so it's not specific to a religion, how spirituality is something that's, that there's a shared aspect of it across all religions and faiths. Yeah, for, so for a Muslim writer, that's a little bit of a conundrum sometimes because I think that um, especially, maybe... You know, it depends on, on who you talk to and what point in time you're at. Our religion is seen as not human. Our practitioners of it are often seen as not human, and people don't want to connect to it, you know? Um, and so, um, but I think you, like, as a Muslim writer, I have to set those people aside, and I, 
I agree with you. There's something that um, there are commonalities that we can connect to when we're reading about someone else's faith. Um, I just finished reading Ruth Ozeki's latest novel, um, The Book of Form and Emptiness, and um, you know it's coming from a Buddhist perspective. Um, and there, and and she made me believe in the things that she was talking about. Um, the the life of objects the the idea of form and emptiness um, and you know this is different from my beliefs but there's so much I could connect to um, and so I'm thinking about how I do that in my own writing I, I think a lot of times for me it's through it's through characters and story I know I keep coming back to that idea of story but um, and as we've been talking, I keep thinking about my grandmother, um, who was this like uneducated, illiterate um, woman um, who was very faithful, but she was never, I don't think she was ever educated in her religion. Um, and I, I, I come back to her and how, you know, she didn't speak uh, like, a lick of English. I think the only two words she knew were hello and kitty, 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 kitty. Um, <laughs> and, and she would meet people and there was, like she would make these instant connections with people. And that seems like it's not about religion, but she is the kind of woman who is looked down on often in terms of how people think of Muslim women. She's not educated. She was married when she was, I don't even know how old, like very young, had 12 children. She is, and, and, and she was able to make that connection with people. So. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I feel like I'm rambling, but um, but I think that that I come back to people and the people who believe and practice, and and I have known other people who believe and practice other things that have that same goodness to them that my grandma had, um, and that's the the big humanity that I think about. One piece of writing advice I I've gotten in the past is is if you're passionate about it, anything can be interesting. And you it's really easy to enjoy something if someone is passionate about it and is in not letting themselves be inhibited in how they engage with it. And in my mind, that's connected to the metaphor of worship as attention. And if worship is attention, and you're bringing someone along into whatever that looks like for you, just allowing the joy of it drive the narrative, and like, why does this, what it, what's the pleasure here, what is the joy here? And bringing that through it, everyone can relate to that, um, and that will pull anyone in. Just to to sort of tie into that, I think honesty and specificity are really important there. Like, I, I am not Buddhist, right? But when I read Buddhist writings that, are, that talk about the Buddhist experience in a really personal and very specific way, I'm gonna connect to that more than I am to sort of vague <coughs> spiritual generalities. Um, because I, 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 f I, f I identify with, like, like Eve was saying, that, 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 that passion and that, that spiritual connection, I, even though, I, even though I, I don't share the tradition, I can share the experience if, if I have enough detail about it. I, I would just add, too, that I mean, I, I think a lot about the fact that over human history, there have been thousands, if not way more, of faith practices. And the other side of that is, within any specific faith practice, you actually have a bunch of individual faith practices. So that's a false unity among the religious groups. So considering that every time we talk about faith, we're sort of talking about what you're talking about, which is finding the common ground, because we're not actually any of us on common ground, and historically, we've, the world's been fractured into, uh, even broadly speaking, so many different faith practices, but there's something fundamental there if it keeps happening over and over and over again. So that's, that's where my brain goes a lot in that subject. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. I keep just ruminating on your question about balancing between passionate and critical and, and how that lands differently 
for different jurors. Um, someone who writes to speak, I'm often writing so that others might hear. And I wonder how in your writing, or whether you're just about sharing your truth, or whether in setting out on a project, you're intending it for a certain audience to hear. So the question was for the video, uh, how you consider audience when you're writing uh, pieces on faith. Can I jump in here? Please. I started out writing with this assumption that people wouldn't get it, people wouldn't be interested, it was niche. It was, or that people would jump to criticize. And I had to be stopped by my writing mentor being like, this is condescending to your reader. This mindset is condescending to your reader. Assume they like you, assume they're smart, assume that if they want to read it, they will keep reading. And that made all the difference. That's, that's wonderful. And maybe assume that they want to connect as desperately as I do. Mm -hmm. Like for, for me, that's, that's what I'm doing when I'm writing is that I, I, I'm, I'm writing well, partly for myself 10 minutes before I started writing, mm -hmm. but, but in the hope that, that that person has something in common with my readers and that they, that they want to feel less alone for that minute too. As a reader, I'm not gonna read something I don't wanna read. I'm not going to keep reading it if I don't want to read it. So if they come with you all that way, they're, they like you. They want to hear what you have to say. I mean, I think, I think too, if, unless I knew I was writing for a specific audience, if I knew I was going to be speaking to a specific group, then maybe that would come a little bit more into play. But otherwise, it's hard to predict the reader, I guess, in, in, in a written format. Anybody else? All right. Yes. Just to repeat, so how big of an audience are you hoping to reach, and how much do you feel you need to explain of things that people who aren't already familiar with particular religious practice or iconography or symbolism wouldn't understand? How much do you feel you would need to explain that in a piece for people, for a part of an audience who might not know it from their own experience in a faith? Oh, I did that right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, in, in part, I think it depends on, on what I'm writing, but I, I think that for, for people who are writing from 
let's say not the not the dominant um, faith perspective. I mean, you know, people drop Bible allusions all the time, and nobody asks them to explain them. Um, I've read lots of works by Christian writers, and I swear I don't get half of it. I mean, you know, and that's fine. Like I can read Madeline L'Engle and not understand the Christian underpinnings of it. You know. Um, but I think for, for, for writers, not from that dominant perspective, things have changed over the years. And so I think in the past, it would have been like, well, we don't get this. You got to explain it more. And I think now the pendulum's kind of gone the other way to don't explain too much or over explaining. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, Google helps because <laughs> Google helps a lot. Because we have the technology. We have the technology for you to figure this out, you know. Um, so I, I think it depends on what I'm writing, but I, I think that, um, you know, I don't feel now that I have to explain as much as I might have felt like, t say, 10 years ago. Um, and I, I think that um, I can hope that I can write it in a way that people don't have to know all the context to get the story. But if they have the context, great Easter eggs for you. And if you're willing to Google, great, you you learn more, right? Um, and and that's the way when I'm reading, you know, I'm I'm reading a, a a book that is written from a Buddhist perspective. I'm googling googling things all the time, you know. Um, so yeah, so that's that's my answer to the question. Uh, I, I would add on to that. I mean, a little bit of, of what Jen said and also a little bit of what Iman said, that as specific as you can be, the easier it is, it's going, the easier that it is it will be for people to connect with what you're saying um, and to find some commonality in what you're saying. But that doesn't mean that you have to dumb it down for your readers because they can go to Google and find what they really need if, you know, if they need more explanation. It just means for me that I, I do feel like I need, I need I have in mind a very wide audience when I'm writing. I want as many people to read what I'm writing as possible. And so that means that I have to kind of filter things down to their essence. What's the most important thing that people are going to be able to grasp onto? So if that means I'm not explaining every Arabic word, then okay. But if I'm explaining something that that's, you probably have in common with me, then you're going to connect with that thing. So that's, yeah, that's how I approach it. Actually, that was interesting, like the, the explaining the commonality as opposed to the difference is actually a different approach. That's interesting. There's also, you gotta keep in mind where you want your reader to end up. What is the journey you are taking them on and how do you want them to feel at the end of it? And does this get you there? Does this information move that forward? Doesn't have to add to the conflicts per se, but does it, does it you know, help shore up the emotion that you want them to feel when you're done with this, this thing? Is, is it going to distract from where you are headed to sit and explain things? Or is it moving the larger narrative forward? Um, I have a lot of friends who are Korean Americans who have all these opinions about writing and explaining things and writing and italicizing words that are in translation or not. Or like, am I going to explain what this dish is and why? Like, who is your audience? Are you assuming that they are going to come along with you and trust you? and Google things as they go? Or are you assuming that they, they need to be protected from their ignorance? I mean, there's a lot of assumptions that come into that and you gotta kind of figure that out as you're heading into it. Okay, I'm assuming this is my, these things about my audience and I'm assuming and I want them to end up here with me. Oh, that's great. Uh, yes, Sarah. Right. That's not what we're saying. That's not what. That's not what we're saying, though. What we're saying is like there are depths. There are depths to certain illusions that maybe not every reader will get, and if uh, some readers will and some readers won't, and and Google gives us that extra thing that that someone can get more from the book if they want. Um, but I, I, but I think also I believe readers need to come towards the 
the writer sometimes, not expect us to come to you all the time. I think I'm paraphrasing something someone else really smart said on Twitter. Um, but sometimes come towards us, right? Um, and and so it's it's like a dance a little bit. Um, you know, yeah, you don't want to you don't you don't want the reader to feel like they have to. They can't read the book unless they have like a PhD in something, but that, that's not what I'm talking about. But also like in my world in nonfiction, and I think you probably can speak to this too, just you're inviting them into your house. It is your rules. You know, your house doesn't, you don't wear shoes in this house. You take off your shoes at the door, even if you, in your home, you, that, you wear shoes in the house. Like, oh, I just, you're, as, as a nonfiction writer, I'm inviting people into my home. And they, they have to comply with some basic rules of decorum within my home. And it may not be comfortable, but it's, it is a learning experience. And they are you know, embracing that by staying there. And on a practical front, I think it's a stylistic decision. Like there's more minimalist prose and there's more maximalist prose. And the experience of reading both is very different. And one isn't going to provide you details in general, and one's going to maybe you know, Dostoevsky, you, we're going to, you're, you're going to get, 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 read a Russian novel. I mean, reading a Russian novel or reading something very minimalist and contemporary would be a very different experience. And uh, that's, that's a whole other conversation, not going there. In the back. <laughs> So uh, the, speaking to the two Muslim writers in particular, but anyone who can answer, how do you, when the dominant discourse is one of Islamophobia, how do you write knowing that that is out there in, th that's the dominant opinion in the world, how are you writing your, wor writing your works uh, with that in mind? I think I got that right. Uh, this is gonna be a short one for me. Write beautifully. It's really hard to argue with beautiful writing. If you write beautifully, people are going to grasp onto it no matter what. Yeah, I think when I first started writing um, fiction, I was thinking, you know, oh, I'm going to educate people, and this was like before 9/11, um, and um, and it took a long time for my book to come to fr fruition. And all, all over that time, I think you know the attitude, attitude and attitudes in the writing world changed, um, and um, the world changed, and I. Um, you know, now it's like I. Somebody talked about writing your truth. Writing, I write fiction, so it's the true fiction. Um, so um, I think th there there are moments when I feel like I know my book is going to make it into someone's hands who does not have good intent when they're reading this. Who are who? I I don't feel like I can I can like fiction is, one piece of fiction is gonna change minds, you know? Um, but I think that more, more fiction, more good fiction, more beautiful writing from this Muslim, per from various Muslim perspectives, that, all of it, can change the world, can change minds, not automatically, but a little bit at a, at a time. Um, we have beautiful stories to tell. We have beautiful words to say. And it's like so, you know, you don't have to go through the tiring experience of worrying about what everybody is going to think about you and your faith, right? Um, so letting go of that, which is hard um, sometimes. I wish I had a shorter answer like you. Yours was great. <laughs> well, um, I want to add an addendum, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, um, so in the response to my book, I have seen people, I have seen things across the spectrum. Um, you know, one review that accused me of, 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 uh, of uh, sorry, um, of misogyny towards my character. Um, you know, uh, and others who said, this is the book I have been waiting to read. Um, I have had people ask me really great, you know, 
wonderful, insightful questions about my book, and I had someone ask me, what about honor killings? My book is not about that at all. It's not about violence towards women. So it, it runs the spectrum, and I think holding on to the people who, who the book spoke to, who found something in the book, um, maybe something new, maybe something they had been wanting to see. Um, that's what's important. And those people are out there, you know, and your, your audience is not all people who have bad intent. Um, and that's what's important. My, my very small addendum <laughs> is, is just to piggyback on what you just said about the various stories. I think that can really help. Just having more voices out there, more Muslim voices out there, so if we can inspire you in any way to tell your story, whatever that story is, that helps because then people won't be looking at your book expecting for it to be about honor killings or about terrorism or because there's so many stories, there's so many out there that people can't you know, pigeonhole and say, well, this Muslim story must be this one thing and it's, that's just not the way it is. So more various stories, please. Sure. In the back row there. <laughs> you need to repeat the question first. Oh yes, thank you. Uh, so, how how did you deal with any family members or people, other other community members in your faith who were maybe offended by what you ended up writing? So, <laughs> um, there's a reason my book's not out yet. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm very very careful, and it has still pissed people off. You cannot please everyone. And they have stories about what is true and who you are that they will not be able to let go because it will have to revise how they see themselves. And they're not able to do that. And that's okay. Um, for every like fundamentalist homeschool dad who has flooded my DMs with death threats. I have had quiverful daughters who have gotten out who have been like, hey, thanks. I was able to get out on my own without doing what you did, which was getting married to get out as a crutch. And, you know, they were able to save themselves the roundabout pain of going through both losing family and divorce and all of the things. Um, just, your story is going to mean a lot to people who are versions of your younger self. And hanging on to who it is for, as opposed to who it is not for, and being okay with not making everyone happy. There's all the if they wanted you to write nicely about them, they should have behaved better stuff. <laughs> that is true. And also, it is not your obligation to bring down the hammer of justice on them. You do not have to tell that story. It is your story. How does it, how does it deal with you? And hang, hang in, stay in your lane. <laughs> And anyone else on that one? All right, well, I'm gonna, I think one more question. I see a hand in the back, so we'll take this question.
So uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna. I, I believe it is. So, uh, in in the world where things are changing so much, how do we tell new stories on these subjects and 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 approach these subjects in new ways in our writing? Is that is that a good summary? All right, thank you. Sure. I'll go. Okay, <laughs> we'll take turns. All right. Um, I I would I would say. Um, Okay, when I'm a small, a brief anecdote. Um, when I was an undergrad, I took a graduate level uh, interfaith class at a seminary on campus. And um, I, I turned in an, an essay and I was like, I'm gonna fail. I'm gonna fail out of this graduate course. I'm, I'm not good enough. Uh, all of the things that I point out are completely obvious. It was a, it was a paper comparing uh, Christian and Islamic fundamentalism. And I felt like everything that I was saying uh, was so obvious as to be just, st just stupid. And I got an A on the paper because no one else has ever looked at the world the way I have before. It, what was obvious to me is not necessarily obvious to everybody. And I would say your story is new because you are new and, and no one has ever seen the world through your eyes before. I can't really follow that. But, <laughs> but now you have I to. I will try. <laughs> I just have homework. <laughs> um, Amy Tan's Mother Tongue essay gets into this really well. I've gotten interested lately in um, uh, speculative futures, the idea of, um, you know, writing about futures that aren't necessarily dystopian. Um, and I, I recently wrote my first speculative short story. Um, it, it wasn't really where I was like, oh, I, I think I'm gonna start writing speculative fiction now. It was more like the idea I had that was how it needed to be told. And um, I, you know, I started looking into like, who else is doing this? And there are some, you know, speculative voices from Muslims and Arab Americans. And um, I was thinking about how so much of the speculative fiction that we know that is popular, it's always said in America, and it's always, you know, white people with some people of color thrown in. Um, and that feels like a n new territory to me in some ways. Um, and, I really enjoyed the experience of writing it, um, and like, don't tell anybody. But I, I want to write it more. Like, I'm like, could this story become something longer? I don't know. But um, so don't tell anybody. But, but like, but like, it was it was really interesting to be able to play in that space where I wasn't like, oh, oh I wasn't dealing with a world of Islamophobia, and I wasn't trying to write against anything, and I was trying to tell a story about f real fears that I have about our future, but also it, it was less dystopian and more kind of like this purgatory. Um, so I guess, what I'm, can I turn that into advice for you? Like, um, <laughs> let's try. Um, so like, yeah, find something new that you want to do and, and try it. Like, maybe if you're, this is for fiction writers, but maybe for all longer form writers, like maybe you have a manuscript that you're not trying to get published that's your sandbox, you know, that you play around with from time to time and you go in there and try new stuff. Or for me, short stories, which I don't write a lot of, but they are a place where I can play around with new ideas more. Um, and new ideas of faith, 
um, new ways of talking about faith. Um, there's got to be a million ways because, like I said, like like our history has so many stories of faith, and they do repeat a lot of things, but always in new ways, right? Um, <laughs> All right. Oh, one more question from up front. Um, yes. I, yes. Yeah, you. I, I don't actually have a question, and I think it's belatedly said, but it really helps me a lot not seeing if each panelist says her name, her first name, when she speaks. Oh. And if you could do oh. that, and I, I should have mentioned oh. this Thank you. earlier, but that would be helpful. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I do believe we though we are though at the end of our panel discussion, so uh, we want to leave time for the reception. Please come and speak to our panelists. Uh, we'll be hanging out for a few minutes, so they're certainly happy because I'm telling them they're happy to. I didn't actually ask in advance, but um, they will. They'll, they'll certainly be happy to speak to you. Uh, a couple of them have some books, so please, uh, if you want to read what they've written, it's amazing, and I strongly recommend it. And Amy is walking to the room off the side with a plate full of snacks. There's some beverages, so please hang out with us for a few minutes and uh, continue this conversation amongst yourselves and with our panelists and with me and with everyone else. So thank you so much for coming.